Welcome this morning to worship at First Christian Church on this July 4th weekend. No matter who you are or where you're from or who you love, you are welcome here. We are disciples of Christ, a movement for wholeness and a fragmented world. As part of one body of Christ, we welcome all to the Lord's table as God has welcomed us. Next Sunday, we have the distinct pleasure of welcoming to worship our general minister and president, Terry Horde Owens. Also at 1130, we will be sharing in a Zoom conversation with her. We hope that you will join us next week. As we gather for worship on this July 4th weekend, it is good that we remember the freedoms we are so blessed to share in America. As with millions of others this weekend, I watched Hamilton for the first time. My heart was touched as I saw so many of our forefathers and foremothers come to life on the stage. It also reminded me that from the very beginning, we were a people who did not agree about many things, maybe even most things. But for the good of the country, they came together and they compromised. Unfortunately, some of those disagreements, such as slavery, would ultimately lead us into civil war. And in our day and time, there seems to be so much division within our country. We pray God will guide and heal our land, that once again we may live together in harmony for the freedom of all. As we celebrate this weekend our American Declaration of Independence, we also affirm our fundamental interdependence with fellow citizens of our community, our country, and the planet. The first declaration of interdependence was written by Will Durant in 1944. Many others have written some since. I share one written by Melanie Bacon, which is so powerful for this 4th of July Sunday. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all life is interconnected and endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights and responsibilities, that among these are presence, compassion, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights and responsibilities, we open our minds and our hearts to the needs of others and our own true needs. We hear the sound of the living universe in our ear and add our voices to the song. We live every moment with awareness of the purity and power of existence. And the support of this declaration, we pledge to each other our love and our breath for the freedom of the one is the freedom of all. And the pain of one is the pain of the all. The breath of the one is the breath of the all. And the breath of the all is the breath of God. May God heal our land and preserve our freedoms so that we can extend those freedoms to all. Let us worship the God of all ages and all people this day.
Let us, pray. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we come to this time of worship this morning, fill us and move us. Empower us to hear your words and pray. May we find time this morning to truly be in this place, to truly allow your words to fill us. May we take time today just to be in your holy name. Amen. What an abundance of gifts we have to offer. Musical talent, the melody of laughter, the use of our hands in cooking and repair, the use of our minds in problem-solving, curiosity, compassion, patience, urgency, spiritual reservoirs, financial resources, obedience, and courage to act. All these gifts and others which bear our personal marks are symbolized in our offering for the work of the church. Let us commit ourselves in service as we worship God with our offerings. We encourage you to try our online giving platform this morning, PushPay, or feel free to mail or drop off your church, uh, your offerings to the church. Let us pray. Accept our lives, O God, as well as our gifts. Let the spirit in which we give them be your spirit. Let the use that is made of them be your use. Amen.
As we gather for prayer this morning, we remember the family of Twyla Larson, who passed from this life to eternal life on Tuesday morning. Our white candle is lit in loving memory of Twyla. We give God thanks for her love and witness shared with us. We also continue to remember the family of Clarice Moore, whose service was held on Tuesday. And there are certainly others who are on our hearts and in our minds this day. Please take a moment and share their name out loud or in the silence of your mind. Let us pray together. O God of grace and God of glory, in the safety of this quiet and sacred space, we lift our voices in humble gratitude for your presence in our lives. We are blessed daily by profoundly meaningful moments of your grace, not only the dramatic once-in-a-lifetime experiences, but also the small, holy moments. Forgiving God, we come to you in worship on bended knee, humbled by all the ways we have fallen short. Lift up our faces and shine your light upon us. And we pray for those who are risking their health and well-being to peacefully protest injustice in a land that promises justice for all. And there are those who point to the protesters and call them terrorists and other names that are meant to degrade and dehumanize and destroy the spirit that cries out to be heard and acknowledged, all in the name of the fear they cannot acknowledge themselves. And then there are those who seek to bring the two together, to create opportunities for healing and reconciliation, only to be abused verbally, financially, or physically in an effort to silence them and maintain the status quo. But may your love prevail. For our hearts ache for peace for all of earth's peoples. For families, communities, nations, and leaders. For unity, not discord. Inclusion, not exclusion. For recognition of the worth of all persons and all your creation. Touch us through your Holy Spirit to be vessels that carry and share your love, to serve and evidence your passion for all of life, to serve your vision with boldness and courage. In the name of Jesus, our Prince of Peace, we pray. Amen. So today is the first in our summer sermon series on the power of compassion. God's compassion poured out for us and the ways that our lives can be changed as we become more intentional about practicing and sharing compassion with others. I had been working on Mission Monday curriculum, writing the curriculum for what would have been a four to five week um, opportunity for families to engage in acts of service in our community um, when Illustrated Ministries released their virtual VBS. You see, because of COVID-19, we're not able to host Mission Camp or Mega Camp, but I still wanted to get into the hands of our families tangible ways that they could do mission together in our community. And when I saw that Illustrated uh, Ministries release their virtual VBS, I checked it out because they called it Camp Compassion. And when I looked at it, I loved it. And I realized that this is what we need right now. 
this is the stories, these are the scriptures, these are the things that we need to be studying and looking at and looking more closely right now. You see, our world is broken in many ways right now. There are many deep hurts and there is so much division that we feel it and see it every day. We can almost taste its bitterness. So I believe now more than ever, it's the perfect time for us to look more intentionally at compassion, at God's compassion for us, our compassion that we can share with others, compassion we can have even for ourselves, and compassion that we can have in God's world. So we begin our series with a very well-known parable. But before I read the parable to you, I want to talk a little bit about what parables are. Parables are a specific genre of literature that we find in the New Testament. And we tell parables upstairs to the children in worship and wonder. And when we tell parables to the children in worship and wonder, we begin each parable exactly the same way. You see, the parable storytelling pieces are kept in a gold box. We bring the box out and we show it to the children and we ask them, I wonder if this is a parable. And then we say that this box is gold. Gold is precious, parables are precious, and then we say that this box looks like a gift. Parables are gifts to us. We can't steal them or take them. They're already ours. And then this next line is really important. We show them the box and we say, this box has a lid. And when we lift it and look in it, we never know what we're going to find. And parables are like that. They have lids, and when we open them, we never know quite what we're going to see or hear. You see, parables were never meant to be straight-up stories. They're not statements of the obvious. They contain layers of meanings that speak to us with a new voice every time we study them. I like what Dr. Amy Jill Levine, professor of New Testament studies at Vanderbilt University Divinity School, I like the work that she has done on parables and what she says about them. She says that parables are art forms. They are designed to challenge us and to get us to see the world in a new or different perspective. She says, if we hear a parable and we think, "Ah, I really like that one. That was really special. That was lovely. She says, well, we're probably not listening very closely. She says a reaction to a parable really should be more along the lines of, huh, that makes me uncomfortable. Uh, That's moving me out of my comfort zone. But maybe this is where I need to be. So I'm going to stand in this place and listen a little more closely to what the parable just might say to me today. So this morning, let's all be prepared to get a little uncomfortable. As we hear and look into an already familiar parable to many of us and see what it is telling us today. And so to get us to ready to hear one of the stories of God, let us sing together, Be Still and Know. Sing with me. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am The parable this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter, verse 11 through 32. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, and he traveled to a different, distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. 
But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and he went to his, fa- and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against you and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the slaves, quickly bring out a robe, the best one. Put it on him and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And then they begin to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and he asked, what is going on? He replied, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working All these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost, but now he's found. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, may the meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth point to you. Amen. So there was a man that had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. And so begins one of the most familiar passages in the gospel. It is intriguing, it is heartwarming, yet it is a troubling story. And it has been used and misused in many different ways over the years. It has been interpreted as a instruction manual on parenting telling parents that they must forgive their wayward child as much guilt as it has laid on to those parents over the years by trying to convince them that they must forgive their child. Even though the harm that was done to the family is felt so deep, the parents just couldn't do it yet. It's been used against the older brothers, the older brother types who just also are not able yet to forgive. It's been used to encourage prodigals of many ages to turn away from their sinful lives and come back home. And it's been used as an example of divine love. But before we get into this parable itself, I believe it's important, just as I believe in all of the texts that we look at, it's important for us to know the context and where we find this parable in Luke's gospel. We are told in the first few verses of this 15th chapter that all the tax collectors and all the sinners were coming near to Jesus so that they could see and hear and learn from him. Now that's obviously an exaggeration because not all of the tax collectors and all of the sinners were there. The writer puts that out there for us so that we can get a sense that know that Jesus at this point is drawing a significant crowd of people following him. And in that crowd of people, there are types that some may not ever invite into their homes. There are types that some may never eat a meal with. There are types that they would never be friend with or hang out with. There are some in that crowd that others would never even acknowledge. But Jesus does. Jesus sits with them and teaches them, and Jesus dares to have a meal with them. And this is what the Pharisees and the teachers were upset about. The religious leaders of the community were grumbling about the company that Jesus was keeping. 
It seems that their chief complaint was that Jesus not only welcomed the sinners, it also was that he dared to eat with them, that he set a table and he shared a meal with them. And so it is in response to this criticism that Jesus is receiving that Jesus tells three parables. The last parable is the one that I have already read to you. The two are also well known by their common titles, the lost sheep and the lost coin. So for us to gain a deeper understanding of the parable of the prodigal son, the most common name for this parable, we need to read it in light of the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. Because when we do that, we see how Jesus shifts the flow of the parables and then surprises us in the third. So we have the parable of the lost sheep. The sheep are counted, and there's supposed to be 100 of them, but the shepherd only counts 99. The shepherd sees that 99 are counted and safe and in the sheepfold, but one is not there. One is still out in danger. So the shepherd goes and collects the one that is danger and brings it back to safety. And then the woman with the coin, 10 coins was supposed to be complete, but she counts and she only has nine. So she keeps looking until she finds the one and brings it back and can count that she has all 10 coins back in her hands. The counting in our parable for this morning should be easy because a man just had two sons. Dr. Amy Jill Levine reminds us that Jesus is speaking to a Jewish audience and they should already be familiar with the scriptures of Israel. And parables, the parables that Jesus told have a way of getting into our memory. And the Pharisees and scribes would have had memory of several other stories about two sons. So when Jesus begins this parable with a man had two sons, Jesus is kind of getting into their memories with this story and then causing them to have a moment of disorientation. You see, they already have an outline of stories of two sons where the younger son is the good son, where the younger son is the hero. Do you remember? Remember Adam had two sons, Cain and Abel. In Cain and Abel, it's Abel, the younger son, who does well by God. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. It's the youngest, Isaac, who becomes one of Israel's patriarchs. And then Isaac has two sons, Esau and Jacob, and it's the younger Jacob who later wrestles with God and is blessed by God and is renamed Israel. So these biblical literate listeners were in for a surprise when Jesus tells this parable because it is the younger son who turns out not to be as righteous as Abel or as faithful as Isaac or as clever as Jacob. This younger son is irresponsible and self-indulgent. The younger son asks for an inheritance and he goes off and he lives and he wastes it all away. He did not use his money to help others. He spent every bit of it. And when times got hard with the famine and he had no more resources to live off of, he goes and he gets a job feeding pigs. And nobody helps him out. And then he remembers that his father's hired hands are treated better than what he is being treated. So he begins to make a plan to go back home, forming in his head what he's going to tell his father. But he doesn't get a chance to speak to his father first and to pour out what he's going to say because his father doesn't allow him to. His father sees him in the distance and his father, filled with compassion, runs to him. Filled with compassion, he runs to his son and he embraces him. Now Luke's audience has seen and heard of this compassion before. They saw this compassion in Jesus earlier in Luke 7 when Jesus had compassion for the widow of Nain when Jesus saw the funeral procession of her only son. They heard about this compassion in Luke 10 with the parable of the Good Samaritan when the Samaritan saw the wounded man and had compassion on him. So this is the same compassion that the father is showing towards his son. The man had two sons. One is out in the field faithfully working, and the other has just been greeted with great compassion, and he has been given a party. He's been given a robe and a ring and new sandals on his feet. A fatted calf has been killed, and they are celebrating. The celebration begins. 
And while all of this celebrating is going on, the elder son is still in the field working. He finally leaves the field and he approaches the house and he hears and he sees that there is a party going on at his home. Here is the hard part to hear, one I hadn't really thought much of before. No one, no one bothered to tell the older brother. No one ran out to him and invited him to the party. The father never told his servant to go out into the field and bring the older brother to the celebration. Just imagine what that must have been like for the elder son to be approaching his own home and to see a celebration that he was never told about or even invited to. Let that settle in you for a second. Put that visual in your mind and in your heart. The elder son hears his celebration, and when he discovers what is being celebrated, he becomes angry and he refuses to go in. So think about this. They had enough time to kill and cook a fatted calf and to create this great party, and no one bothered to go and tell the elder son. They never took the time to get and go get him. It was if they forgot about him. A man had two sons, and he forgot to count. Jesus just finished telling two parables of counting and making sure that all are present. And this is the punchline, if you will, of this parable. The father forgot to count. He finally realizes that his elder son is not at the celebration, so he goes out to him. And the elder son is angry, basically telling the father, hey, you have played favorites here. You have been more generous to your younger son than you have been to me. And this is how the father responds. He says, son, well, actually the Greek... um, Translation is better. It's translated as my beloved child. So the father says, my beloved child, all that is mine is yours, and this your brother. In saying that, in saying that this your brother, the father is already laying out a foundation for sibling reconciliation. Did you catch how The elder son did not say, when my brother came back. No, he says to his father, but this son of yours. The father obviously heard it because he comes back with, this your brother. This brother of yours, once dead, has come to life. Once lost, has been found. And then the parable just ends. It ends. There's no real closure. And so what what just happened here and what are we supposed to do with this? So let's go back. Let's go back to the stories of the other brothers, to the memory of the stories of other two brothers, Cain and Abel. We all have to admit, Cain got a bad deal. But Cain is still a member of the human family and we don't forget him. Ishmael was tossed out of the community. But when Abraham dies, Isaac and Ishmael together bury their father. Esau had every reason to hate Jacob. But decades later, he returns and they kiss and they reconcile. Remembering these past sibling stories helps us in this sibling story. The elder son was left out of the party And upon realizing this, the father goes after the son to bring him to the party. And he sees, the father sees that his two sons are going to need some reconciliation. He sees that there is going to be some work that needs to be done. So today, what is this parable asking from us? How is it challenging us? In what ways is it causing us some discomfort? 
I believe it is asking us to ponder over who is it that we have forgotten? Who is it that we have left out? Who is it that we have written off, disregarded, thought less of, devalued? Who is it that we have failed to see the image of God in? So yes, this parable is about forgiveness and grace, but maybe also, maybe this parable is about counting. There once was a father that had two sons, and he forgot to count. But when he remembered, he went out to the one forgotten to bring him to the table of celebration to join the feast. Once he remembered, he went out of his way to include him in the feast. So how do we as people of faith begin to go out of our way? How do we as church create community and set tables and prepare feasts that truly does welcome all? Is this not the vision of our church? Is this not the vision of First Christian Church? To share the good news that God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit welcomes all and empowers all to serve. So maybe, just maybe, this parable is reminding us about our calling to welcome. Our calling to see and to welcome. Reminding us to count and to see who has been left out. So when and how do we make sure that all are counted How do we then value the humanity in each person in such a way that each individual knows that they count? That each individual knows that they have not been forgotten? Do you see what what the father did for both sons? He went out to them. He ran out to the son coming home, and he went out into the field to find his elder son. He did not wait for them to get to him before he shared his compassion and his love for both. There's a phrase or a kind of thing that's been mulling in my mind a lot lately as I am discovering there's a lot that I don't know, a lot I have not been paying attention to. So the phrase is, what is, I thought that I knew, but I didn't. But now I do know. And so now, since I know, I need to be doing better. So once we do see, we need to be doing better. So maybe this parable is about counting. The sheep, they were counted, and, and one was looked gone after and brought back to safety so all 100 were taken care of. The coin, she counted until she saw that one was missing and she went and found the one so that all 10 could be complete and in her hands. A father looks around and he sees and he noticed that his eldest son is not there. He forgot to count at first, but then he realized and he saw that his son was missing. This parable challenges us to count. This parable challenges us to see who is being left out. Who is left out from the feast? Who's being left out from the celebration? Because for Jesus, no one should ever be left out. For Jesus, every person counts. Compassion and action helps us to see, and it helps us to welcome. Compassion in action calls us to step out of what we are comfortable in and with to go and see the humanity in each person. Compassion in action makes sure that we never let anyone feel as if they have been forgotten. Now more than ever, we need to share God's compassion because for Jesus, no one is left out. 
every person counts. are from the funeral of Twyla Larson as we shared together on Friday. As we told her story. In the musical Hamilton, the last song asked the question, who will tell your story? Part of the lyrics say, and when you're gone, who remembers your name? Who keeps your flame? Who tells your story? When we come to the table of Jesus Christ, we tell his story. And he said to us, when you do this, remember me. So we come to remember and to tell his story. For it is up to us to tell the story of his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his continuing presence leading our lives. We need to tell the stories of forgiveness, of welcome, of challenge, that everyone matters. We need to tell the stories of what Christ continues to do through us. So, dear friends, let us never forget to tell the stories of Christ. Let us share together the prayer he taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the night of the Last Supper, in the upper room, Jesus took the bread. And after he blessed it, he broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Take this as often as you will in remembrance of me. And let us pray. Gracious God, when we have been prisoners to our own fears, you have set us free. When we have been blind to the needs of others, you have opened our eyes. When we have been low in spirit, you have lifted us up. When we have hungered, you have given us bread. Let this bread of communion remind us, O God, that you provide for our deepest needs, that in the presence of Jesus Christ, we have found our nourishment and strength. Help us remember, dear Lord, that as you have met our needs, it is for a purpose. You want us to be your people bringing freedom, light, hope, and bread to the world around us as true ambassadors of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. In a like manner after the meal, Jesus took the cup. He blessed it and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Will you pray with me? Holy God, bless this cup as we remember the love and sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we walk in his footsteps and spread his love throughout the world, for we pray it in his name. Amen.
bow down and hear our cry. Our earthly rulers falter, our people drift and die. The walls of golden tomb us, the swords of scorn divide. Take not thy thunder from us, but take away our pride. From all the terror teaches, from lies of tongue and pen, from all the easy speeches that comfort cruel men, from sale and profanity. places and all times. Let us pray. God, this week fill us to be those people of welcome you've called us to be. Challenge us to step outside our comfort zones and see all those around us as your children. May we go forth knowing of your blessing and grace in our lives. In your holy name, amen.